The fountain pen, voila. Today we're gonna to be hatching a seahorse. That's a play on words. We're going to be inking a seahorse using the hatching method. So there's no cross hatching. Hatching is where you're just using lines next to each other and you're not crossing them. Very little overlap. Any overlap that there is is purely by accident like there and they kind of add a nice kind of human nuance to it. But there is, I think, a grace and a hazy ghostly style to it, which is part of why I've tended to favor it. Only once I got really detailed with some of my ink drawings did I go into cross hatching, but I went four or five years just doing the hatching method. I'll kind of go into that a little more in the video. And of course, hatching a seahorse being a play on words, even though seahorses do not hatch from eggs, they hatch from pregnancy. And you may or may not know, it is, I think, the only species that we know of, or one of the few in the world, where the male carries the young in pregnancy, gestation, but the female still has the egg. She deposits them into the male. Uh, one of the theories, I think, for this partnership style, evolution-wise, is that the female has to make thousands and thousands of eggs. So this gives her more time to do that, and then when they're ready, she gives them to the male, he carries them, and then he'll wind up birthing them out. It's pretty wild. He starts kind of shooting them out like a machine gun. Thousands and most of them die. That's why they have to do it this way. And by the way, for those of you who think that the male carrying around the babies makes him less of a man or something, just keep in mind, the seahorse is arguably the most lethal predator in the world. Like a kill rate of 97%. I mean, that's respect, respect the seahorse. So we've got tools to talk about. This paper is mixed media, a uh, hot press. I like to use slightly on the thicker side like this, not your typical sketchbook paper because that paper will be a bit thinner and it can buckle because ink is, it's liquid and it's moisture. So if you keep any of it on, any amount on, it can buckle. If you're using liquid ink like I use, uh, that buckling might turn into ways that make the ink run a little and you don't want that. You wanna really control it. With cross hatching, you can make a mistake and you can cover it up. However, with hatching, you make a mistake and it is laid bare. In this case, any mistakes that came, I was a fan of, I was partial to. It was part of the charm of the technique. Anyway, that's our paper. Let's talk about the other tools. I like to use India ink. It is wondrously waterproof. So you don't have to worry about it afterwards. Then we have the fountain pen. This is two parts. So the first part is the nib. And that is a pumpkin head nib. It's referred to, I'm very affectionate towards this. So I love to use it. And then I have the fountain pen nib holder. This is not the pen. So then you put them together and you have the fountain pen, voila. This is your rag. I use any old piece of cloth and it is just beautiful how it just gets this, all these reminders of uh, past ink victories on it. It just feels like a friend. Uh, the last thing, uh, I used um, a 2B uh, pencil. I use a pencil holder so it makes it longer. Put it in the wrist. This way it's fast and loose. I get a little more uh, particular when I'm doing the illustration and you'll see especially with inking you're going into a territory where the stakes are higher whereas when you're sketching just stay fast and loose but I don't really go into that too much in this video this video was more about the inking not the penciling so those are our tools let us hatch a seahorse and there he is the seahorse that we're gonna hatch First, we're doing this pencil sketch, and I didn't really spend much time documenting the origins of how the sketch comes because, of course, this is an inking video, not a penciling video. Nevertheless, I can talk a little bit about it. What you eventually want to go for when you're inking is that there is less and less detailed reference for the pencil sketch. I think if you're doing a job or a commission, you want to think pragmatically, you want to have a sketch that has enough detail 
where you're not going to be flying blind or you're not going to be under too much pressure once you start inking. And certainly when you are first beginning with your early ink drawings, it is important to have details in the sketch so that you just know where you're going. But it is also important to cultivate that instinct of, do I really need this detail here? I know what this is. Do I need to show that this is darker than this part or that I just want shading? Just do what it takes to help you see the piece. I made these kinds of earlier mistakes when I was beginning. I spent way too much time on penciling and I started to realize that the inking didn't quite look as good and especially when I erased the pencil afterwards. And now I'm at a point where my pencil sketches for an ink illustration, I should say my under sketches, have so much less detail in them, sometimes I even forget to erase them, which is something I'm very proud of considering where I started, where I was addicted to pencil sketching. When you're doing ink drawings, be aware when you're addicted to the under sketch. So now we have the inking, and you can see I'm just taking my time with this part. Now, part of the reason is I have done hundreds of ink drawings, but one thing I've learned and drawing or sketching is like anything else you do in life, kind of understand your psychology, understand where you get too excited, where you don't think. I was really taking my time on these lines, on the outline and everything, because I have to retrain my brain each time to go from the penciling brain <laughs> to the ink brain. And the difference is the penciling brain doesn't have to worry. You can erase, you can go back, you can start over. The inking brain is constantly crossing the point of no return. Add to that, the type of inking that I'm doing is not going to be forgiving for mistakes. In other words, hatching, which I wanna talk about now, is different from cross hatching because with cross hatching, you have almost a limitless amount of shading that you can do. And for those of you who want to really get a sense of cross hatching, I made a really nice cat video, who doesn't love cat videos, making an ink drawing of a black cat from reference with cross hatching. And you'll see, I mean, you can just go all over the place. And if there's a mistake, you can just cross hatch that. But with hatching, you can't quite do that. And I actually adhered to a certain principle. No one told me. I just remember when I grew up reading comics and I was devouring all the work that those comic artists did. And I remember there were some artists where I just loved their use of hatching and cross hatching. And then there were others that just did overkill. And I remember I saw one and I just thought it was so lazily done. <laughs> and the, the cross hatching became very obnoxious. And from that day on, I just thought, you know what? I think I'm more of a fan of good old hatching. And if I can get through an ink drawing with as little overlapping as possible, I think that is more elegant and more beautiful and more intriguing, more haunting, more everything favorable. And it wasn't until years later that I really started to look at that again. But just look at the dimensions that are happening with this hatching. Hatching, of course, is where you're taking a series of parallel lines and you're using that to fill in an area to give the sense of shading. Now, the closer those lines are to each other, the darker that shading is gonna be. those lines are, 
the lighter that shading is going to be. And just look at what hatching does. I mean, if this was not, if this was cross hatching, honestly, you would lose the ghostliness of the seahorse, in my opinion. And seahorses, I feel, look like two things. They look like ghosts and they look like carcasses. <laughs> and there's something so ghostly about the way the seahorse moves, but also the seahorse relies on looking like a carcass because it is attached to something and it needs to look like part of the scenery so that it can attract its prey, which are little, very, very small creatures that just kind of float by and then it just waits till the right moment and gets them. And it's doing something right because the seahorse is arguably the most lethal predator in the world. So it knows what it's doing when it's just camouflaging like that. Now, if I was cross-hatching this, I'd really have all the shadows and everything, and it would look more, I'd say, like a carcass. But this is the beautiful thing about hatching is there's something kind of hazy, almost watery, these dimensions. If you can get hatching down, you, get, you attain an aura of ghostliness and elegance to your ink drawings. Because cross-hatching will be much easier to do down the road. Hatching, on the other hand, and I did this for years. I did hatching for, I think it was four or five years before I went back into cross-hatching. And I still, I still don't depend on cross-hatching. I'm always deliberating on the first decision in a drawing. Because once you do that, it becomes a cross-hatching drawing. If I was to draw a line and on one side I'd go inking and on the other side I'd go cross hatching and then the middle I'd go hatching, I feel like there is so much room for nuance if you just do the hatching first. Don't rely on dark shadows, i.e. cross hatching. Go with light and the medium light and see what you can do there. So you can see right by that nib, that area I just did right under the nib there, there's a part that's dark and a part that's light. They're right next to each other. And all that's happened really is that the darker part, the lines are closer to each other. And in the dipping fountain pen uh, fashion, because it's fresh from the inkwell, those lines are thicker. But when they're thicker, they're closer together, so it still applies. But now in this part, I'm kind of, I keep looking at the whole seahorse. And I'm being kind of conservative because now I'm at a point where I don't want to lose this negative space. This is kind of like watercolor type of territory where once you cover up a piece of white, you're not getting that back. I don't have white out. <laughs> I don't have white paint. And I can't make a part that was accidentally covered. I can't make it lighter by cross hatching another part and making another part darker. So there's really going to be one baseline for darkest in this piece. And there's going to, 
And that's going to be the closest those lines can get without overlapping. And then there's going to and then there's a baseline of course for the lightest, which is just the blank white paper. So I have to really be careful with how I'm playing with light. And that of course for me is what Ghost in the Gaslight is all about, which is well, ghost stories, but art-wise it tends to be studying light. And you can see there's some parts here that are a bit darker. You know, you can see what I'm talking about where the neck meets the the body. There's like a really dark spot there. So that's that gives me an idea of my baseline. And I, I'm not going to say I planned that. <laughs> that's an accident. Uh, that's me getting a little worried that I got a little too intense there. And now I'm doing uh, kind of a version of what I call scouting, where I'm just going away from that area. And I'm doing something in a totally different area. And I'm going to go with the tail fin and just kind of see this is a repetitive thing that's happening it's quieting my mind a little and that's what i mean by just keep un, keep in mind your psychology keep in mind what's happening to you i was getting too intense in that dark part so i had to get away and i had to go rediscover what this piece is about and that's one of the really fun things with drawing is that yeah you can take breaks and you should i think it's Maybe not on a sketch like this, but when you're doing something that's a little intense, it's good to, you know, go go schedule your exercise at that point. If it's home exercise, even better. Go do your 20, 30 minutes and then come right back and you see a new piece where before you were kind of losing it. Or sometimes you can take a break within the piece. So in this case, I took a break from drawing the body and I went and did the fin. And now I've kind of collected my thoughts again because I did that meditative exercise of doing the fin there. And now I'm feeling calm again. I'm not feeling overwhelmed, which yes, I can totally feel overwhelmed even by a little piece like this. But I'm also dealing with the fact that I haven't really done a hatching drawing in a little while. I've actually done a lot of cross hatching and so I'm getting my bearings. And you see, I'm just, now I'm just, I even, right there, I took a break between the strands of the fins. I thought I was getting too repetitive, so I d did a break there, and then I went backwards. And now I'm going again, and I'm like, okay, I'm seeing this. And now I'm used to stopping. I don't mind stopping. So it's okay to leave that there. And I'm going to go do another thing. So now I'm trying to keep myself in a loose frame of mind by jumping around and, and hatching wherever I want to. And this is great because now this is, it's almost like I'm using the negative space as its own stroke. When I hatch and then I don't do any more there and I go somewhere else, it's almost like I've just drawn some negative space there by leaving it which is great. And then I can come back and then you see, then there's points where I'm thinking I could fill some negative space in there. And in this case, don't forget, I'm going with a reference here. So the reference called for it that, oh, that part is definitely lighter. I'm going to leave that. But this part, it's okay to do a little shading. But look at all the places that we've gone since I got too intense on that part. And now I'm coming back to this section. I feel like I'm not overwhelmed by it. I feel now more confident as I'm building more shading. And it's conservative, it's patient, and, and there's nuance to it. And once you're in that place, it really doesn't take long to get to the end. That's kind of the beauty of doing all this work where it's all kind of taking you over as you're figuring it out. And then I tend to leave the face, whether it's a person, whether it's a seahorse, whether it's a black cat, a wolf, an owl. I usually try to leave the face to the end because by then, and it's the same principle as going from pencil to ink, by then you have become familiar with the medium. You're the most confident you're going to be with it. 
and in all likelihood you've hit the flow state. And uh, you want to make a habit of really cleaning the pen throughout the piece. Don't wait till the end because each time you dip it, there's a little bit of the old layer before and that's going to cake and coagulate. And then your line is going to get thicker and thicker. You're going to lose that nuance. And so you want to just keep on cleaning it. There you have it. We have a newly hatched seahorse. Hope you enjoyed this video. You got a little value out of it. Always like to know what you think, so be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments and leave a like, it always helps me there. And make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss another video. And also, if you'd like to learn a little more, there's other episodes of The Spirit of Learning. And then I've got my book. This is Rediscover Your Creativity. This is about giving you some steps to put a little more creativity into your life which I think we could all use. And I just wanted to give back a little because you guys have been so great, whether it's been on the print shop or uh, writing emails. I really enjoy our interactions. Nice little book, see? It's an easy read. But there's some fun things in here like the science behind creating art. There's lifestyle hacks. I go into the creative mindset. You'll find little philosophies that have helped me along the way. Pick up a copy and enjoy, and I'd love to hear what you think and leave me a review. All right, well, that's enough from me, and I'll see you soon. May the Spirit move you to create something beautiful. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Saul here. Wait.